for Barnsley Central, Catherine Fletcher from the Conservatives, Dave Dugan, the SNP for Angus, SNP MP for Angus, and political commentator Reem Ibrahim. That's next. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, police searching for the missing baby near Brighton say they've discovered remains in Woodland. Officers have been given more time to question Constance Martin and Mark Gordon on suspicion of gross negligence manslaughter. They were arrested earlier in the week after they went missing in January. Detective Superintendent Lewis Baseford says the investigation continues. This is an outcome that myself and that many officers who have been part of this search had hoped would not happen. I recognise the impact this news will have on the many people who have been following the story closely. The government wants people to wait for the COVID inquiry before judging its handling of the pandemic. Former Health Secretary Matt Hancock has rejected claims he ignored advice about how to protect care homes in England. The parents of a teenager found in conditions said to be unfit for any animal have been jailed for 13 and a half years. 16-year-old Kalia Titford, who was disabled and used a wheelchair, was left to become morbidly obese. And scientists think they're a step closer to developing a nasal spray to treat the most common form of motor neurone disease and some types of dementia. Early stage work suggests using a substance called peptide could prevent the death of nerve cells. LBC Markets report the FTSE 100's closed up 38 points at 79.14. The pound buys $1.20 and €1.12. LBC weather staying dry tonight with a low of minus one. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Serena Farrow. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross-question with Ben Kentish. 8.02 is the time. Ben Kentish here with you on LBC. Joining me in the studio for cross-question tonight, delighted to say we've got an MP panel. Dan Jarvis is here, Labour's Shadow Justice Minister and MP for Barnsley Central. Also, Dan, of course, a former mayor of South Yorkshire. Catherine Fletcher, the Conservative MP for South Ribble, who was a minister in the government of Liz Truss. Dave Dugan joins me, the SNP MP for Angus and the party's defence spokesperson in Westminster. And Reeb Ibrahim is here, political commentator and the communications officer for the Institute for Economic Affairs. Call 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ben Kentish. This is LBC. Quick reminder, if you've got a question for our panel, the number you need is 0345 60 60 973. You can tweet 84850, uh, text 84850 or tweet at LBC. Lots of calls coming in already. There are a few slots left, so ring now and you should get through. Right, Mark in Enfield is going to kick us off tonight. Mark, good evening. Oh, good evening. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, sir. What's your question for the panel? Well, you, you sort of generated it uh, 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 from your last piece, which I was going to comment on anyway, which was, what, what do the panel think uh, this is driving this vitriol towards Matt Hancock compared to anybody else that you yourself mentioned, in fact, any, anyone else responsible? You think it's unfair, Mark? I Well, if you want my honest opinion, I'm not sure a, a single government, or a, a, and you, you touched on it, in history and all around the world would have done they would have made different mistakes they they okay. they you know they they would have they might not have made the same mistakes but they definitely as every government in the world did make mistakes yep i hear you mark let's put, let's see what the panel think uh, catherine fletcher are people being unfair to matt hancock um i think we covid was unprecedented so I was on the Science and Tech Select Committee at the time and I remember the wall of different opinions and different scientific evidence that was coming towards us. We've got to make sure that when we look back, and like Mark says, work out the things that we didn't do perfectly in a really difficult time. We've got to learn those lessons, but you've got to do it with all of the data. And I think the thing that's disappointed me about some of the stuff in the press today has been it's just a small sh snapshot of the data. We don't even know if we're seeing all of the messages. You know, I certainly haven't had a chance to read whatever volume it is. You know, there are certain things being pulled out. Is that selective? Um, but for me, we've got to 
get on with the inquiry, let it run its course and learn the lessons because these are not necessarily things that won't trouble our door again. And how do we make sure we get it right next time, if I don't use the right word? <laughs> What's your impression of Matt Hancock? He does seem to have this knack of winding people up. I don't really know him. So I can't really speak for him. Is he popular amongst your colleagues? He's come from he comes from uh, northwest of England, as do I. So he went originally went to school in Chester. So I think he supports the wrong football team. But is he the, popular amongst Tory MPs? Well, the conversations I've had with him about his grandparents in Warrington and being a minor, but it's very brief because most of the time I've ever spoken to him, it was about stuff to do with the pandemic. But you do know, people like him? Hard. Do people like him in your party? I, I genuinely don't know. I I can't I can't comment. I don't okay. know the guy. Okay, not a, not a ringing endorsement from well, Catherine he's there. a work colleague but you know okay let's move to Dan Jarvis mm. people are being unfair and blaming so much on Matt Hancock well I was in government during the pandemic as a regional metro mayor so I remember having to make some incredibly difficult complicated judgments not to the same extent as Matt Hancock and senior members of the government but it was an extraordinary time as Catherine said it was unprecedented the likes of which we've not seen in living memory so let's not pretend that any of this was easy because it just wasn't. It was incredibly difficult and political decision makers nationally, regionally were under huge pressure and we were having to make very, very difficult decisions. I have to say though, I think at the heart of this story is the fact that tonight there will be thousands and thousands of families who are still grieving. Grieving because they lost loved ones in care homes. People who will remember very clearly that they followed the rules, they did the right thing, and they weren't able in many cases to go and say goodbye to loved ones who passed away. And they will inevitably, to, to some extent, be kind of pouring over the coverage of all of this, which I have to say, I do find a bit unedifying. I think the appropriate forum for all of this is the public inquiry. I think it's really important that good progress is made with that. £85 million of taxpayers' money has already been invested into that process. I think it needs to get on. I think it needs to take uh, the evidence and, and hear from ministers uh, and do its work in terms of drawing meaningful conclusions from the process. I have to say, I'm not... Um, it's an ind independent process and I wish them well, but I'm not convinced that we're going to get meaningful findings from it this side of the general election. I hope that we will. But I think first and foremost in my thoughts, are all those people who lost loved ones in care homes mm. during the pandemic. Did you have to deal with his team and him directly quite a lot, Dan, when you were Metro Mayor? Well, not as much as I would have liked, in the sense that, um, for reasons that you know, maybe you can understand to a little bit, that the approach from national government during that crisis was incredibly centralised. So I worked very closely on a cross-party basis with the other Metro mayors. Collectively, uh, we represented 20 million people across London. There were Conservative Metro mayors like Andy Street in the West Midlands we worked very closely with. And it was a source of great frustration to us that from the outset of the pandemic, we said to government, look, we're here to help. You know, this is a moment of national emergency. There's a lot that we could do at a regional level. Let's work with government, whether that's about the, the health aspect, whether it's the, the impact of, you know, the huge economic impact that, that, that obviously the pandemic had on communities right across the country. But it was an ongoing source of frustration that we didn't see meaningful joined up government as part of that process. And I think the whole thing could have been, or despite all frictions and despite the complexities of it, if we brought people together, mm. national, regional and local, we would have been in a more uh, effective and joined up position to respond. I, I think, I, I do think that's interesting. I think we go look at some of these messages, look at the timestamps on some of them that are going to be coming out. Um, I'll certainly appear within that data dump at some point offering help in a similar way Dan was. You know, we've just had this evidence from science and tech, you really need to look at it. And um, I think the sheer volume of what's happened when you're faced with something that unprecedented is not is, is also is also people asking for decisions. It's also people offering help. And I think the the central. I think one of the key questions that the um, inquiry needs to answer is that scale of centralisation versus localisation. I do agree with that, but make sure that it's in the round because could we have delivered an enormous vaccine rollout with localised decision making you know is it does what's good for the goose in terms of mm. a well leading three three time vaccine rollout mean that it's slightly more remote for some of the social distancing measures be really interested to see what the inquiry does uh, Reem Ibrahim 
Hi, thank you for having me on. I think I, what's interesting about this debate here is that we aren't entirely sure what's going on because we haven't got the COVID inquiry. And I think that I, I'd like to echo that, that, that perspective. First of all, we, we don't know what's going on. We don't know what the full picture is. But we do have a snapshot. We do know just from that from those small amounts of text messages that we that Isabel Lokeship published herself. We, we already know that there is an element of Matt Hancock and his sort of um, lying. And we, 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 we aren't entirely sure what the full picture is, but we have an idea that he potentially did mislead the public and potentially did... About, about what, Rim? What do you think he lied about? Well, he, he lied about the fact that he was advised otherwise when it came to care homes and actually testing those those people. And we all know people that were negatively impacted by COVID, by the lockdowns, by people, not just those that have been bereaved and that have had to, unfortunately, suffer huge amounts of debt as a result of it. But actually, we're looking at the COVID lockdowns now and the impact that it's had economically in the long term. We've got rising inflation. We've got a rising cost of living. We've now got also um, huge amounts of debt that the government have raked up during the COVID lockdowns. These things have to be understood. And the fact that I think, Matt, you know, we've got to be clear about the fact that Matt Hancock was health secretary. He did understand that this, this was what was going on. I, I do, however... No, I, 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 th I think there is a corollary to that, though, because mm -hmm. you, for every action that was taken, you were getting three sets of advice that said one thing and three sets of advice for the other. So I think it's a little black and white to say lie. I think judgment calls were made with rubbish levels of evidence because we didn't really have it in the time. And some of those judgment calls will be right and some of those around. And I think that's what the COVID inquiry is why we need to do it in the round rather than not just on a randomly leak set of messages, uh, you know, I, I including I, I, I the effects sort of, of um, as, You know, we, we can we can spe speculate about what may or may not have happened uh, during the time that he was health secretary. We can speculate about whether or not he did mislead the public or not. We don't know the evidence until yeah, we get the COVID inquiry. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, do we think that some of the anger that's directed at Matt Hancock is linked to how he's behaved since leaving office? Dave Dugan. Um, well, first and foremost, Matt Hancock is demonstrably a deeply flawed character. I think that's self-evident. I don't think we need an inquiry to figure that out. However, flawed in, in what way? In his, um, in his opinion of himself and the decisions that he's made and the way that he's thumbed his nose at his colleagues in Parliament and his constituents in deciding to disappear for weeks on end and go on a reality a TV show. Um, I also don't think that's a particularly edifying thing to do for somebody who held such a serious job who, if it had been done differently, let's not say better or worse, would have had very significantly different outcomes for many people who have suffered real tragedy and loss as a result of the global pandemic. And I think in terms of his performance as a minister and a secretary of state, he was responsible when COVID broke he was responsible for elevating that up the legislative agenda of government. Nobody in this room or anywhere else would have expected the Prime Minister of the day to take it seriously. So Matt Hancock should have been the one that was carrying the flag for stop everything, this is serious. Because don't forget what the rhetoric was when things turned really nasty in Italy. The rhetoric from the top of government was that couldn't happen here because we have the NHS absolutely shameful, shameful complacency. And that's not about having 2020 rear view vision. That's about taking appropriate risk, about weighing up the threat from something that's clearly happening. It was very far away in China. It was getting closer in Italy and it was not appropriate. Now, that's not to say precisely what should have been done, but it was not high enough the legislative agenda early. And now we are all experts on pandemics and we know that the longer you leave things, the worse, the, the bigger the hill that you're going to have to climb. That. Um, so I think I've actually got it in my diary. It's the 29th of January. So I'd been a, an MP for a whole five weeks. And I went to a briefing with Chris Whitty, a health minister and an FCDO minister. So this is prior to the escalation in Italy. And that was an all MP briefing. And can, I went because I have a background in biological sciences. So I kind of, there were some warning signals there about is this Spanish flu. So I went to find out. But that meeting was open to all MPs and relatively poorly attended. I think a lot of us with uh, have got very slightly caught with the complacency of the healthcare system that we've developed in the 21st century and novel pathogens caught us slightly unawares. But I wouldn't suggest, I don't think it's fair to say that 
government was sitting on its hands. I think it was already starting to brief and develop a response because I saw it firsthand. So I don't think it's I don't think it's the job of backbenchers to marshal the machinery of government. Well, it was ministers that were calling the meeting. A global pandemic. It, it was, it, and it was ministers that were caught short and caught napping. And if you want evidence of that, it's quite clear where the evidence of that lies. The United Kingdom is a developed economy and an island nation. And if you compare our COVID statistics with any other uh, developed island nation, whether that's New Zealand or Australia or Japan, you will find very much better outcomes from their population than we achieved in the United Kingdom but for this our is, population. This is do you still think though, that New yeah. Zealand is, is really a, a country that we should necessarily be comparing ourselves to when they had you know one or two cases they immediately locked down in, you know, immediately after that? I think that we've got to ba- be, be able to balance freedom with the evidence that came with COVID. And we can look in hindsight, potentially whether or not you think the second and third lockdowns were, um, were feasible or if you think that they were needed. That's a debate that we can have in hindsight. At, during the time, I mean, I mean you, you've got three MPs on the panel here. During the time, MPs themselves had no idea what was going on. And we had no idea what the future was going to look like. And we had no idea whether or not the, this COVID pandemic was actually going to spur out of control to the point that it did. And I think that what, you know, we, can, we can talk about in hindsight whether or not these things were right. But actually, I think in the long term, um, we, nobody knew. Catherine, just briefly before we go back to Mark, Mark's question was about who's ultimately responsible. Do you think Matt Hancock is effectively carrying the can for Boris Johnson? Ultimately, if mistakes were made, the buck stops with the Prime Minister. I think you can't make that judgment call until you've actually seen all the evidence. I think the point I would make is you've got a snapshot of one man's WhatsApp messages that does not contain the answers to the total of what happened during an unprecedented global pandemic. And I I then I just slightly pick up to MPs didn't know what the, what was going on. Science and, Techno- Science and Technology Select Committee, I know I'm going to keep going on about it, but it's a function of government. We talked about it. We had Sarah Gilbert um, in private. We had lots of different people there talking about this. End of January, first week of February, the machine was ticking. If anything, the lack of awareness was within the media because they're not necessarily got science and business backgrounds. If I'm, if, But I think that's part of what should be in the inquiry. How do we galvanise a society to convey these messages, honestly. And of all the question marks we've put around Matt Hancock over the last 15 minutes, we haven't even touched on uh, the COVID monies and where they ended up. And we might come on to that in a minute because our next question is also on COVID. Uh, that in a moment. Let's just go back to Mark. Mark, very briefly, if you would, sir, I wonder what you've made of, of, of what you've just heard. Uh, well, there's definitely uh, some of the answers definitely have a, uh, a link to uh, a political uh, axe to grind and others don't. Uh, I don't particularly blame anyone. I mean, Boris Johnson lost his job ultimately over it uh, at the end of the day. He didn't, did he? He lost his job because he was partying through it, or his team were. Yes, because of his own rules in COVID. So, you know, his his, his incompetence cost him his job, didn't it? He didn't lose his job because of the way the pandemic was handled, but I take your point, Mark. Uh, Matt Hancock also lost his. Other people who you might say had some involvement still in government. Mark, thank you for your question. James in air is next. James, I'll come to you in just a moment. The time now, 8.18. This is LBC. In a...
21 the time with me in the studio for cross question tonight Catherine Fletcher the Conservative MP for South Ribble also Principal Parliamentary Secretary to Oliver Dowden the Cabinet Office Minister uh, Dan Jarvis is here uh, the Labour MP for Barnsley Central also former Mayor of South Yorkshire Dave Dugan joins us the SNP MP for Angus and the party's defence spokesperson and Reem Ibrahim political commentator and communications officer for the Institute for Economic Affairs right let's get our next question which comes from James in Air. James, hello. Yeah, good evening, sir. Um, my question is, at the end of the day, is this COVID inquiry going to effectively be a whitewash? OK, James, thank you. Uh, Reem, is the COVID inquiry going to be a whitewash to you? Well, it depends on what we mean by whitewash. Do we mean that it's going to entirely change the narrative and entirely change the consequences of the COVID lockdowns? I don't think so. I mean, we know that you know the facts are there, that we know that ministers and we know that the prime minister at the time broke the COVID lockdown rules that they implemented themselves. N nothing can change that. We know that those are facts. What it might change, however, is, is the perception of, of whether or not the, those ministers were advised in particular ways, whether or not Matt Hancock, for example, was misadvised or ill-advised, or if he took those, that advice. Um, I mean, as Catherine said earlier, different, you know, ministers are given a multitude of advice from various different sources. So I think what we will get from the COVID inquiry is clarity, but the consequences of the COVID lockdowns will not change. Uh, Dave? Yeah, I share James's concern, um, but I'm going to be a bit glass half full about it. I hope it's not a whitewash. I hope we get um, answers to the pressing issues that people in all of our constituencies have, which is, um, could things have been done better? Would my loved ones still have been be here if things had done better? Um, and there's obviously um, a an awful lot of... Um, Public resource, especially money, was expended um, in, uh, in during the pandemic, and I think people will be rightly concerned to know that that uh, was spent well. I think they'll be disappointed in that ambition, um, but they'll then need to know to the extent to which it was spent badly um, and how much of it was lost to no value add. I think... I don't think it's acceptable to say, you know, the pandemic was really difficult. We know it was really difficult, but it was universally difficult. And so there's a comparative assessment to be made about the performance of the United Kingdom government, governments within the United Kingdom, uh, more broadly across Europe and in a global context as well. Because I think people with, will want to look back with hindsight and say, was I and my family significantly disadvantaged by the uh, reality of being in the United Kingdom during COVID, and if we lived, if we had a different regime in this country, similar to other parts of the world, would we be better? Would we have fared better? Uh, and I think you know, there's a, a human, an element to the human condition which puts bad stuff to the very back of your mind. And I'm already getting a bit hazy about the ins and outs of COVID, um, and that's because I'm in a very fortunate position. Is, is that the risk? Is the longer this goes on, the <laughs> more that happens, the more things get got to kick down the road. Yes, uh, but but. It, but, but I think there's an essential element of healing in that, for both individually and familiarly and in societal terms. We need to look forward, not back. But at the same time, uh, COVID was uh, the, the ultimate shot of war. Um, it's the ultimate way that the state has to respond to protect uh, the population. Um, and, and the United Kingdom did that. Uh, and so did the other um, governments within the United Kingdom. But to what extent were the decisions made poor decisions, and insofar as they were poor decisions, um, how much, um, uh, what effect did that have on people and the mortality rate in the United Kingdom, which was dreadful. And why, just COVID. briefly, Dave, Kathy comes to you in a moment, why, why do you say you share James's concern that this might be a whitewash? Um, well, it's not just that it might be a whitewash. I think people are concerned about how long it will take. Um, and uh, I, 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 I do hope it, it's not going to take as long as many other public inquiries have taken. And I hope it's not a tome of general observations. Um, I hope it has uh, something uh, approaching conclusions and recommendations uh, and they can... Uh, they can uh, take representations from um, from uh, patients groups, from care home, sit from the care home sector, from the NHS, to understand exactly how everybody in their individual sectors and circumstance was affected by COVID, and get answers to the questions that they have. Catherine Fletcher. Um, 
Sir James is saying, will it be a whitewash? My honest answer is, I flipping hope it's not, because this is too important. You, you know, the, these these things were once in a century. We are um, in, we are uh, as well publicised by the like um, esteemable likes of Sir David Attenborough. You know, encroaching on animal technology. We're coming into contact with zoonotic diseases more. It is possible that this could happen again. Um, the inquiry is independent. I think that's right. You know, I don't think it should have political weight. It's way too important for that. Uh, if I had one thought to maybe echo, it, it the inquiry needs to not only be correct in a legal way, but it needs to be boosted by scientific capability to make sure that it understands what the nature of the advice that was given. So I would agree with Dave. I don't want general observations about, you know, the difficulties of government absorbing this stuff. I want to know how scientific advice was evaluated for good or ill. I would challenge there, but I think we're banging in the middle of the pack on um, excess mortality and, and are actually better in, in many countries. Um, but the data will show it as a scientist, you know, look at the numbers. So I don't want it to be a whitewash and I, I don't believe anyone in government does either. Just briefly on the point about expertise, Catherine, do you think it was a problem in the middle of a once in a century pandemic pretty much nobody in a ministerial position in power and government had any scientific or epidemiological background um some of them have got science degrees so therese coffee has got a phd in chemistry so i don't think it's fair to say that she was what she was at the time at environment yeah, but, but, but these, these were cabinet level decisions so i don't think it's fair to say nobody did but um i would say that broadly across the spectrum we need more people with that capability and don't listen to me listen to the evidence that kate bingham gave and i think she's put plenty of articles out saying it's not even the elected representatives mm. that need that capability it's actually the machinery of government and it's not a critique of the i mean look at the timestamps on some of these what up messages whatever was happening you can't see people were getting much sleep i remember right at that start of the pandemic you know people were sleeping under desks to do their best for the british public in both civil service and political roles and, and you know i think everybody acknowledges that people is, isn't the hard. concern that that expertise still isn't there i think we'd agree on that whatever this inquiry finds isn't there a risk that the lessons won't be learned because ministers will say i've got more pressing priorities there's not gonna be another pandemic for years to come that insight and expertise still isn't there and we risk making the same mistakes all over well, again I, 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 there's two ways to do that you can have vaguely i'd like to say i was normal before i stuck my hand up to join a political party 10 years ago but i wasn't <laughs> but you know this that's the open call to arms to anybody listening step forward pick a yep. pick a political party bring that expertise to the table it's important okay uh, thank you james thank you for your question our next uh, question is a text Right, sorry, sorry, Dan, I didn't... Yes, of course, I missed you out. <laughs> Forgive me, go well, and fire away. Uh, I, I wanted to respond because I think it, it's an important question and it speaks to a broader concern that lots of people have that we will never get to a point where we're able to draw some meaningful conclusions about what was a terribly traumatic period in, in our nation's history. Thousands of people lost their lives. There was a collective national trauma. And I think it is incredibly important that we take the time to properly look back at that. I don't think that we are particularly good at doing inquiries in this country. I lived through uh, the process of the Chilcot inquiry, which I think went on for sort of seven or eight years. We've never even done any kind of investigation mm. into what happened to Afghanistan, a massive commitment for our country where hundreds of British servicemen and women lost their lives. So I think culturally, we're not especially well organised or, or geared up towards conducting these things. But I think it's important that we get this right. I mean, th there was an interesting um, point made just a moment ago about the conduct of individual politicians insight and expertise, of course, that's really important. But what I think the public expect is grown-up decision-making. They accept that this is hard. They accept that on occasion politicians will get things wrong and make mistakes. But they want people to lead with integrity and they want people in the highest offices of government who they can trust to do the right thing. I don't know what this inquiry, when it finally reports, will conclude. But my sense of it is that history will not be kind to certain very senior people in this government. We're chatting about Matt Hancock, and I understand why that is the case. In the end, the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has to take responsibility. And my strong sense of this, that history and the inquiry uh, and, and the view that people take uh, right around the country will not be kind to the leadership that you provide over what was admittedly a very difficult period. But I think we'll look back and... 
I would say and the vaccine rollout. I mean, it's li- we li- we're literally world leading on the vaccine rollout. Yeah, I, I would concede that, Catherine. The vaccine rollout in the United Kingdom was very good, but if there had been a little less of the world leading narrative and a little bit more concentration on the actual process. Boris Johnson, everything had to be world leading, even when it was patently at the back of the queue of competence, whether it was the track and trace or test or, and trace. Yeah, yeah, it was just, it was, and, and we've got this, and he would say it was world beating. It was anything but. But just so I can demonstrate that I am capable of not being political all the time, the <laughs> vaccine, the vaccine rollout was Spoken very like good. A true it was very good. Yeah, well, we have to face truth every week. <laughs> okay. Go on, very briefly, no, the, the amount of taxpayer money that was wasted as a result yes, of um, the PPE scandal, and then you've also got the the amount of money that was just wasted uh, during government spending will eat up to help. There out is an extent in, a, in, a, in when the pressure is such as it was at that time. There are going to be wastages in the system. Risk had to be taken. Of course, and there, there will always be risk, and there will always be wa- wasted. But I think with the COVID inquiry, we should be looking back in hindsight and actually thinking about whether or not that, that money could have been cut back. I mean, we're talking about experts in government. Nobody in in political life is an expert. That's not their role. They're supposed to represent the people. If we want if we want a technocratic government, we've got to change the entire system. MPs, politicians, they're not supposed to be experts, not supposed to be scientists. They're not supposed to be COVID experts. They're supposed to represent the public and the people's interests. I don't think they did that during the COVID lockdown. And, it, and it's important that the inquiry is far reaching and looks at um, associated issues as well, like the total abdication of the United Kingdom to properly repatriate people stranded abroad mm. at the very start of it when European countries or European neighbours were flying people from all over the world back home the Foreign and Commonwealth Office were absolutely putting a tin ear to MPs uh, trying to get their people back home I until it was that. absolutely yep. uh, too late and also um, when Heathrow was not shut down yes quickly enough lots for the inquiry to consider lots and lots for it to get into right our next question a text question from Jonathan who asks Rishi Sunak is set to go ahead with his new Brexit plan even if the DUP don't support it is this fair get our panel's thoughts on that question in just a moment first though 8.32 the time let's get some news headlines from Serena Farrow a body has been found in the search for Constance Martin and Mark Gordon's baby. Police have been given more time to question the couple on suspicion of gross negligence manslaughter. Matt Hancock has disputed claims he rejected advice on coronavirus testing in England's care homes. The former health secretary says leaked WhatsApp messages have been doctored to create a false story. And the Duke and Duchess of Sussex have been asked to leave Frogmore Cottage on the Windsor Estate just weeks after Harry's book Spare was released. Reports claim the move was approved by the King. LBC weather dry mainly across northern Scotland tonight. Further south, a little bit of shower around with a low of minus one degree. This is LBC. In a cr-
to Cross Question on LBC. I'm Ben Kentish and with me in the studio, Reem Ibrahim, political commentator, the SNP MP Dave Dugan, Conservative MP Catherine Fletcher and Labour MP Dan Jarvis. Our next question, I'd mentioned it before the news, is from Jonathan in Lagan. He says Rishi Sunak is set to go ahead with his new Brexit plan, even if the DUP don't support it. Is this fair? Is that fair, Catherine Fletcher? Um... I think the Prime Minister is really clear that he's giving everyone time to have a proper look at it. I mean, it's such a big deal. It's, it's fair to say he's, you know, bashed loads of expectations out of the water with this. You know, lots of people thought it wasn't possible to reopen the treaty. Lots of people thought it wasn't possible to have a negotiation of this scale with the EU, given the tumultuous few years. What he's really clear about, and he said it, he said it repeatedly in public and in private, is this has to be about protecting the Good Friday Agreement and the settlement. So I think it's really important that we all don't do anything to jeopardise that by commenting on it whilst people are having a good look at the detail. And there's a lot of detail in it. Yeah, you know, everything from um, customs and goods movements across the sea, so there's no border there anymore, to applicable rat rates, to making sure that the storm and break allows for the democratic deficit to be moved away and for storm and... They don't assembly. sound convinced, though, do they, the DUP? How big a risk, how big a gamble, how big a problem could it cause if he tries to force this through without their support? On lots of things, I'll do ifs. Um, but on this one, I think it's more important. That's, so, that's so a I'm, key question. No, but I'm from the northwest of England, and, and semi-seriously, I grew up with people that had been on both sides of the sectarian debate because I'm very old and fat. And, and, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> and, yes. and, But I remember as a girl, speaking to people that came from an Irish Catholic background and people that came from an, an Irish Protestant background, and we were teenage girls, and they were crying about what had happened to them during the Troubles. It is almost personal to me to make sure that we do everything we possibly can to see to let people make their own decision because nobody in Northern Ireland likes being told what to do and I'm not going to start doing it on LBC. And I think in a different way, that's what the Prime but, Minister but can said. He, have a my bit question of time wasn't about debate, it was whether Rishi Sunak can get it through without their support. Dan Jarvis, can he, do you think? Or is that going to cause him all sorts of headaches? Well, it, it, for slightly different reasons to Catherine, I've had a very long-standing interest in the, the fragilities and the complexities of the politics of, of Northern Ireland. So it would be churlish not to acknowledge and welcome the fact that this is a very significant moment and it's a very significant step forward by the Prime Minister. It would also be, uh, I think, only fair for me to point out that this is um, in response to uh, the poor management and handling of the process under the previous but one Prime Minister. I think it's only fair to, to make that point. I mean, I genuinely uh, wish the Prime Minister well. I mean, uh, he, he's found himself in an incredibly difficult situation of essentially getting a hospital pass from his predecessors and trying to sort of stitch together an arrangement that will improve the situation in, in Northern Ireland. The DUP are a very important um, a sort of stakeholder within this arrangement. I, I am hopeful and confident that there will be support from every political party in the House of Commons for the proposals that have been brought forward. We've been very clear as a Labour Party that we will do the right thing, that we will act in the national interest and the best interest of people of, of Northern Ireland. And Keir Starmer has been very clear about the fact that we will support the Prime Minister with this deal. I hope it can be done in a way that brings all the political parties, not least the DUP, together and we can sort of move forward on that basis. Is that crucial, Can he do this? Can he implement this deal without their agreement? Well, I hope that we won't find ourselves in that situation, uh, and I'm confident. But we can that we, we can we, we can hypothesise a little bit. The the noises that have come out of DUP today are hardly very positive. He might need to try to implement a deal that relates to Northern Ireland without the support of one of its biggest parties. Well. There's another very significant piece of legislation going through Parliament at the moment, which is about the um, the Veterans and Troubles Bill, which has support from no political party in Northern Ireland. And this is something that the government wants to proceed with. There is, I think, an acknowledgement that a much better way to do that is to get that political consensus, get everybody around the table and reach an agreement. I think it's perfectly legitimate for the DUP to take time mm. to look carefully at the detail, to get the legal advice, to consult, consult with their colleagues back, back in Northern Ireland. But I am, I'm going to say confident, but I am hopeful that they will see that this does provide a very significant opportunity to move forward. That is in the interest of the people of Northern Ireland and it's in the interest of the rest of the country and as well. And the storm and break does give them the opportunity I'm to get the sovereignty that's so important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to go to Dave Dugan next. Dave. Okay. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, 
Good, good, good luck to Northern Ireland. They've been largely de-Brexited by, by this. They've got, they, they're they back inside uh, the European single market where Scotland would dearly love to be and stem the losses we're making by being ripped out of the European Union and the single market against our will. Um, so, but, you know, it, it ill behoves me to... to um, to wish any kind of um, impediment to um, the negotiations that are going on between the DUP um, and uh, and the UK government. The DUP, uh, quite rightly, in my view, think that they've got the trade piece sorted, or certainly as sorted as you will do in the kind of counter-reality of Brexit that we find ourselves in. Uh, the protocol is gone. That's obviously a good thing. It's certainly a good thing for um, businesses um, in Northern Ireland. Um, but the sovereignty issues are still there. That's the bit that the DUP will be looking at. But I'm concerned uh, by uh, the, the storm at break. I, I, I think it, something had to be in there to allow it, but I think the threshold of 30 members of the Northern Irish Legislative Assembly is quite a low bar. Um, the, 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 Jonathan's only question, though, Dave, to Jonathan's the question was about whether he can push it through without the DUP support. I presume you think that he shouldn't, because if it was Scotland and the SNP didn't support it, you would be saying that's undemocratic. Well, routinely we uh, decline to give uh, legislative consent motions to uh, to legislation for the United Kingdom government. It changes precisely nothing. So um, I, I'm, I'm not minded to think that somehow um, DUP MPs are more MP than any SNP MPs are, or for that matter, uh, Alliance MPs or SDLP MPs. Um, so I think... Uh, some of the rhetoric that Rishi Sunak's come out with um, is a little exaggerated in terms of what he's managed to achieve uh, and it's also very partisan not political party but unionist he's um, been very keen to sh polish up his unionist credentials presumably to try and bring the DUP closer to him but the DUP that. are a bit smarter than that they'll not be flattered in that way and it's surprising that Rishi Sunak doesn't know that but they are limited in their numbers in Westminster and they should be um, a, a, a approached on that basis. But of course, when you're talking about... So they Northern shouldn't Ireland, have a veto, effectively, on this? I don't think they should. Okay. Um, they should be able to make compromise the same as everybody else has to. But it, it, like Dan has said, uh, you know, my, my parents are from Donegal. I went on holiday there every year through the 70s and 80s. I saw, albeit fleetingly, from the back of a car, mm -hmm. what Northern Ireland looked like in those years. And nobody... And I also saw the transformation when peace mm -hmm. came. Nobody is looking backwards. Yeah, we're not. OK, right we are going to move on. Lots of questions coming in. Our next one comes from Ben in Clacton. Ben, good evening. Uh, good evening, Ben. Good evening, panel. The National Health Service is failing to meet the targets for cancer treatment. And and do the panel uh, think that this is to do with underfunding as many areas of the National Health Service uh, to be solved? How can this be solved? Uh, thank you, Ben. It's meeting, failing to meet its targets in all sorts of areas. Reem, is this about underfunding? Absolutely not. I mean, we spend just, just below £200 billion on the NHS every year. I think that when we've got a National Health Service that has failed time and time again in order to uh, to deliver for the people. I mean, we're, we're letting down taxpayers, but we're also letting down patients. We're also letting down nurses and doctors who work tirelessly within the National Health Service. I think that we need to have a very honest conversations with ourselves as a country and think about whether or not the NHS is actually a feasible solution for healthcare in this country. What would we do instead? It, look, I, I think that actually a more free market healthcare system where the, we put the consumer at the heart of it is really where so we privatize it. Um, yes, well, essentially, yes. If we privatize the NHS, but actually, if we were to um, think about the voucher system, think about the Singaporean system, the Swedish system, the German system, there are countless examples across the world. And I think that, generally speaking, when we're thinking about this, is a dirty word, privatization of the NHS. People are scared of it politically. But actually, when we're thinking about privatization, we don't just look towards the US. There are more than two countries in the world, for goodness' sake. Let's look to European countries. Let's look at South Asia where they have more free market healthcare systems and it's delivered better but they also spend less. We've currently got upwards of 7 million people on waiting lists. It's clear the NHS isn't working and we're spending more than we ever were before. But when doctors and nurses and pretty much everyone who works in the NHS are saying to us as they do day in day out, obviously, this is about money, this is about investment. You're turning around and effectively saying you're wrong. 
well, the money isn't reaching them, is it? It, it, it? We've got mid-level management and a huge amount of bureaucracy within the NHS. So th th those people are probably right. The nurses and doctors aren't feeling the money, are they? Because the money is being spent elsewhere. The NHS is a huge bureaucratic black hole and we're just throwing more taxpayer money at it and it just, just it's not working. OK, Dad, I can see you itching to come in. You'll have to wait just a moment, I am afraid. You'll listen to LBC. I'm Ben Gedges. We'll be back in just a moment. 8.46 the time. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. The year 10 pupil said to be autistic was told to bring in a copy of the Koran by friends. The copy of the Koran was damaged after it was allegedly dropped in a busy corridor. The police intervened to look as if whether it was a hate crime. Hassan in Peterborough. The fact that we're even talking about a Koran. Because West Yorkshire police said it was a hate incident. Do you not think we've got better things to worry about? That's what this conversation is about. I would get the relevant copper in and I would say school deals with this itself because kids throw books at each other. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC. Got an Time. Welcome back. We were talking about the NHS. Does it need more funding? Are its problems due to a lack of investment? Uh, Remy Bahim from the IEA was saying we need to look at privatisation. I suspect, Dan Jarvis, Labour MP, you might disagree. I do, I, I do disagree with that. I think the, the point that I would make is that those who serve on the front line in the NHS are the heroes of our country. They do extraordinary work. I was in my local hospital on Friday and I always come away completely inspired by their dedication and commitment. But the reality is that they are worn down, demoralised, they feel like they are undervalued. They had an extraordinarily challenging period working through the pandemic. I remember some of the conversations I had with nurses and doctors during the COVID pandemic and it was just humbling to see the level of commitment that they were prepared to put in. The question specifically, though, is, is a good one about cancer care. 
I'm really sort of sad to see that the government have backed away from the the 10 year cancer plan. Um, there are very significant regional disparities in terms of the level of cancer care treatment that is available. We're struggling in my part of the world to recruit enough oncologists. There are many more oncologists in other parts of the country than there, there is in, in South Yorkshire. And I'm also really struggling to raise money that is desperately needed to invest in my regional cancer care centre, which does extraordinary work, not just regionally, but nationally as well. It, it, it provides a fantastic service, but it's now 50 years old. And despite numerous attempts to try and sort of secure investment to invest in that particular facility, that money has, has not been forthcoming. So. I, I very much hope, and I discussed this with the Cancer um, Minister, Helen Watley, um, Catherine's colleague, the other day, I very much hope that the government will draw together the basis of a strategy, that they will marshal the resources that are available, and if more resources are required, they will find that investment, because this is an absolutely critically important issue. We need to make sure that having now come out of the pandemic, there can be no further excuses for long waiting lists. And but there's no record diagnosed. funding going in, Dan. Do you think the, sort of, the current government is effectively being blamed for the mistake of previous Conservative governments? Um, I, know, I think all governments of different political colours have found the management leadership of the NHS very challenging. It's this hugely complex organisation and of course it must change and move with the times. Um, but I do think that there are particular pressures in terms of the system's ability to provide the, the level of cancer care that my constituents uh, both need and deserve. So we're not where we need to be and I hope very much that the government will look at what more can be done so that we can improve cancer outcomes. I just ask, sorry, you recognise that there is institutional reform that needs to happen within the yeah, NHS do, and really. you recognise that the NHS, you know, with socialised healthcare, it does a lot and the NHS does so much and I think it is too much and we, I think you also recognise that we can't keep throwing money at a system that is broken. So do what kind of institutional reform do you think should be brought forward? Well, I think if you look at what Wes Streeting has been saying, you know, Wes has been very clear about the fact that we do need to look at how the NHS, the NHS operates. We do need a workforce plan. We do need to make sure that those incredible people... Would you break people, up the NHS? No, I, I, Would you sell any parts of it? No, I, 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 I certainly wouldn't. And, you know, good luck sort of presenting that <laughs> argument to any any kind of member of the public and then expecting them to, to support well, if, you if because... Well, they they'll get more power and more consumer choice within the healthcare system, I think that they might be very supportive well, of it. I, I, I think the, the experience of, of, with great respect, people living in London can often be quite a different one from people living um, in more remote parts of the country. So the, the point about oncologists I made earlier, there is a very significant increased number of oncologists working in London than you will find in Sheffield, providing incredibly uh, important services for, for people who, who are you know, facing <laughs> incredible personal challenge because, because of the impact of cancer. So this shouldn't be a sort of political uh, football, I don't think, what the public expect is that the correct levels of resources are marshalled. Um, we, we went backwards during the pandemic, and you can understand the reasons why why that was. But the government needs to play catch up, needs to work with the NHS, needs to work with amazing charities like Cancer Re Research UK, who do extraordinary work, uh, and make sure that there is the investment and the workforce uh, and, and the sort of scientific development so okay. that we can provide... I sense you two could argue about this all night, <laughs> potentially. Yeah. Let's Maybe go to Dave Dugan, SNP, MP for Angus. Yeah, so the... There's record investment going into health um, in Scotland, 19 billion in the coming financial year. That's from a total Scottish government budget of 59 billion. So I don't think anybody in Scotland can think that there's um, a shortage um, of money uh, in terms of the Scottish government's availability to find that money. Things would be a lot easier, um, and 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 Scottish government have um, a, a, a offered a 6.5 percent pay deal to. Um, Agenda for Change staff in the Scottish NHS, which includes uh, nurses and midwives, etc. Um, and I think it would be a lot easier for uh, the devolved nations in the United Kingdom to marshal their finances around health if the United Kingdom government would give a similarly appropriate offer uh, to nurses in England, because of course we talk about the United Kingdom government, but we were talking about health. It's the English government really we're talking about. Uh, and so it's high time that they uh, recognise the esteem with which these extremely hard working healthcare professionals are held within society uh, and pay them accordingly. Not just because of what they did in the um, pandemic, which was truly extraordinary, uh, but because of what they do day and daily uh, to help make better health outcomes for people. But 
The English government, when it comes to health, is in complete denial. They, since I've been in this parliament down here, they've been talking about integrating health and social care, which we did a decade ago in Scotland, and I was heavily involved in it in my part of Scotland, so I can tell you it's not easy to integrate health and social care, and the longer you leave it, the harder it is, because the impact of delayed discharge um, in hospitals is a colossal waste of money. The failure of the English government to get to grips with a whole system approach, where you don't talk about the NHS in isolation because it doesn't operate okay. in isolation. You've got to talk about care as well and crucially what's never talked about is public health. We need to get around the front end of the conditions that are costing so much in the NHS in lifestyle choices uh, but the, the Conservatives in particular in the Westminster Parliament are obsessed with the nanny state and they won't do anything <laughs> to try and help people make better We're choices. <laughs> just, just on that, we'll come to the NHS in a moment, just on that point about social care Catherine, you like all Conservative MPs were elected on a manifesto to bring bring forward a long-term plan with cross-party consensus to fix once and for all the social care crisis. Where is it? Um, uh, currently slightly delayed due to a global pandemic, which is where we This is such a priority but, when it comes to health. OK, but I think uh, the days of uh, anybody being able to articulate a quick soundbite, I think Dan's almost started to touch on it in his comments, the fact that you can give a quick soundbite and that fixes the NHS, which is, I agree with him, you know, probably the best mm. idea we've had as a country, a free at the point of use healthcare system. You know, the rest of it for me is arguing around who provides that free at the point of use, but nobody is going to get a credit card out when they're bleeding to death in any. It's not but happening. But that doesn't happen ab abroad at all. I mean, the, the, this well, idea that you, you get a heart attack and they get the card it, machine out just is not reality. No, no, well, it, well I've lived no, abroad and it is. is. Right, it seriously. Is. And, it depends and, and on the country, but we're thinking about... There are people in the US that don't get treatment yeah, yeah, they can't there afford. There are more than two <laughs> countries in the world, for goodness sake. We're thinking about well, the Singapore. No, 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 I didn't live in the US. Let's Okay, let's not... Let's. I accept that there's a debate to be had, but there are countries in the world where you have to get your credit card out when you're bleeding to death and I'm not living in that yeah. country. Now, what we do need to do with the NHS is recognise that there's very differential performance. We've kind of touched on it. And if you could get the bottom quartile of the NHS trusts, which is like the build, the geographic disparity that Dan's talked about, if you could just improve their performance and improve the way they learn lessons from the best trusts, and that's not necessarily geographic, then actually that cross-facilitation learning could really... I, I, I saw a stat, I think you could eliminate or halve some of the waiting lists in cancer times just by improving the performance of the bottom quartile. That's been before you've gone elsewhere. Can you so do I that without a, a lot more cash though, Catherine? Because that was that was Ben's well, question. Is the problem if, underfunded? But if, if Trust A is, is performing at this percentile with the same level of funding as Trust Z is, then it's not solely a question of cash. It's a question of leadership. It's a question of lessons learned. It's a question of culture. Isn't it's it? also, Catherine, a question I, of recruitment and, so I, and retention. And so to Dan's I, point, I, you, I, you, you recruit an, an oncologist for St Thomas's a lot easier than you will for nine wells in my constituency. Well, I, I, well true, but one of the lads I shared, I shared a, a, a house at uni with like five medical students and one of them is now a consultant paediatrician in Sheffield and loves it and has moved yes, his family right. there and he's wonderful. So, I, you know, I don't think there's any percentage sat in a London studio have said, oh, you know, don't want to go live in these funny regions with weird accents because we're all stuffed in this panel, aren't we? Um, but I do genuinely think there's something about the hard yards of bringing up the performance of the lowest trust and I know that's what like Helen Waitley's looking at in mm. social care. OK, two word answers, please, to our final question from Bob in Reading. He says, Harry and Meghan have been asked to clear their things out of their old house in Windsor by the King, apparently, so Prince Andrew can move in. Are they getting what they deserve or being treated unfairly? Uh, Reem Ibrahim. I literally do not care. Can we please stop talking about Harry and Meghan for once? Short to the point. Dan? I think it's very much a family matter, but I'm sure the King will do the right thing. What do you make of Harry and Meghan? Are you a fan? Um, that they've ploughed their own furrow, and I think people should let them get on with that. But I think um, so. You think they're getting what they deserve? Uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not I saying, like I'm not that. saying that. that. I'm not saying that. Like I support uh, what the king does. Okay, Catherine. It's the king has my full confidence in what he's doing with the private family matter. Even if he's giving us a cottage to someone with Andrew's uh, record, shall we say? Do you know what I think when I think of Prince Harry? I think of a very young man walking behind a coffin, mm. if I'm honest. I think and just let him and his family deal with him and, uh, and, and, and best of luck to him in the future. And Dave, finally. 
Good luck to them. Couldn't care less. <laughs> <laughs> Good note to finish on. Thank you very much, Sean Palace. Thank you to Reem, Dad, Catherine and Dave. Thank you for your calls, texts and tweets during Cross Question. Coming up in just a moment, we're going to be talking about on-screen representation. According to a poll today, almost half of people in this country think there is now an over-representation of minority groups and people with disabilities when it comes to television. I struggle to understand that, I've got to say. Is that just effective racism. Is that what we're talking about here? Or is there a good reason you think why people might believe that and have that concern? It's also been reported this week that there's a backlash at posh actors, to call them that, playing working class roles. Does it matter who plays characters on screen? How important is representation to you? 0345 6060 973 On your radio, on Global Player and play LBC leading Britain's conversation this is LBC From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, police have discovered the remains of a baby in a wooded area close to where a couple missing for two months were arrested near Brighton. Constance Martin and Mark Gordon's child was taken out of hospital without a proper assessment after birth. The couple were spotted on Monday and are now being questioned on suspicion of offences. Graham Wetone was a police officer and says despite the circumstances, detectives will continue. Forensically examine the scene itself, take away anything that there might be evidence um, from the crime scene. Post-mortem will be carried out to establish the cause of death and then from there the investigation team will take their inquiries onwards. Matt Hancock has rejected claims he ignored scientific advice on COVID testing in care homes in England during the pandemic. Former Health Secretary says leaked WhatsApp messages show a distorted account of what happened. Leila Moran, the Lib Dem chair of the all-party coronavirus group, told Tonight with Andrew Marr that victims' families need to hear soon. At every turn, they are the ones who have been let down. And I think it's just right now that the inquiry needs to take from this. We can't wait. It cannot be years. It must be months, but the, and weeks ideally, before they start putting out interim reports, which is what the all-party group has called for, to get to the bottom of what actually happened. The information watchdog says it won't investigate the leaking of Matt Hancock's WhatsApp messages. A couple have been sentenced to 13 and a half years for the gross negligence manslaughter of their disabled daughter. 16-year-old Kaylea Titford was found dead at her home in October 2020. LBC's Daniel Bevan has more.